So of the 24 living species of crocodilians, we generally regard them as morphologically conservative. So to generalize and stereotype, generally these are freshwater animals, ambush predators, with roughly similar body patterns, although obviously there are some sort of small differences with these longer snouted forms. And uh, as I say, we can generally regard them as sort of having roughly the same sort of body plan, and they also show evidence of cryptic adorability. Uh, however, when we look at their fossil record and their sort of much longer evolutionary history, so now I'm talking about Crocodilomorpha, the more inclusive grouping uh, spanning the last 250 million years, we see a much greater range of diversity uh, in terms of both their body plans, but also their geographic range. So whereas today they're restricted to about 25 degrees of latitude either side of the equator, in the past they had a much more global distribution. So their fossils are known from all continents, um, even down into Antarctica and the Arctic Circle, so up to a paleo latitude of about 75 to 80 degrees either side of the equator. And as I said, they also show much greater uh, diversity. Uh, so we see fully marine forms, including these flippered ones from a variety of different lineages, so a number of different lineages sort of entering the seas. We see animals living in very much terrestrial, even semi-arid environments, cursorial animals, even some herbivorous forms. Uh, we see very small species, less than a metre in length, such as the toposaurids, and some giants, such as Sarcosuchus, uh, as well as some sort of large-bodied Notosuchians. So a much wider range of diversity and geographic range, very different to the present day. And in general, when we want to try and understand the evolutionary history of the group, we might want to look at a lot of different sort of aspects. But one particular sort of way of looking at the diversity of a group is to actually try and look at diversity in terms of numbers of species or genera through time. Now, if you want to actually do this rigorously, we need to actually think about things like sampling bias as well. Uh, I think very few people would consider we could actually take the fossil record at face value. So there's been a few studies trying to look at the diversity of crocodilomorphs through time that have tried to take into account sampling biases in one way or another. So the earliest of these, and really a sort of very pioneering study from 1998 from Paul Markwick, well ahead of the curve before anyone was doing these kind of studies, uh, he used a standard sort of classical way of rarefaction to look at crocodilian diversity in the last sort of 120 million years. Um, and then more recently, two studies from 2015, one from Paul Lumiardi. These are just looking at Notosuchians, a particular clade of now extinct crocodilomorphs, primarily from the Southern Hemisphere. And they tried to correct for sampling biases in terms of the amount of outcrop uh, available at any time. And in the same year, myself and colleagues published um, a subsampled approach. So basically using a method called shareholder quorum subsampling, uh, devised by John Alroy, um, to try and reconstruct diversity dealing with various aspects of sample size. And what all these different studies show is that it is possible to reconstruct diversity of crocodilomorphs through time after correcting for sampling biases. What they all show is that the fossil record of crocodilomorphs, like most other fossil groups, is extremely biased. And not only is it biased temporally, but it's also biased spatially. So whenever we're sampling from a particular time interval, realistically, we're not sampling in a global signal. So we can debate whether it's worthwhile looking at global diversity in the past regardless, whether that actually is a really meaningful entity. But regardless, when we're reconstructing diversity in the past, we're always really looking at regional diversity to some extent. If you look at these reconstructions, each of these colors represents a particular uh, paleo continent. And it's very rare that we have more than one colored blob in any of our time intervals. So spatial bias is equally important as well as temporal bias. So all those methods are trying to sort of correct for various biases in the fossil record. But one aspect that none of those really capture, and what might sort of be sort of another aspect of bias we see in the fossil record, relates to the actual completeness of the fossil specimens themselves. So we can try and sort of calculate the completeness of the fossil record in lots of different ways. We can try and sort of assign uh, specimens to particular bins. So for instance, you might say, you know, a specimen is represented by a single bone, a bunch of bones, a whole load of bones, multiple individuals, and maybe give them sort of arbitrary values of zero to five or something like that. Um, or we can try and sort of try and break down the skeleton into sort of constituent parts. So really give an idea of the actual sort of, say, the volume of the animal and sort of weight various parts of the skeleton accordingly. So for instance, we might say the humerus makes up, say, 1% of the entire body of the animal. And so if it preserves two humeri, then the animal is 2% complete. And so obviously we can then sort of build it up and give it a percentage completeness. And we can also incorporate things like sort of degree of um, articulation, for instance, those kind of measures. But another way of doing this actually relates to trying to incorporate phylogenetic information. So how much of the animal do we need to know 
be able to actually, sorry, say, score it for a foul genetic analysis. So really capturing the sort of amount of information that's preserved in the skeleton. So going back to that way, for instance, we have our humerus preserved. Uh, before, it was representing, say, 1% of the skeleton. So if you have two humeri, you have two of them, say 2%. But all we need is one humerus to know everything there is to know about that species' humeral morphology. So essentially, we can use phylogenetic characters of the skeleton to give it an idea of completeness. So essentially, we could have a 100% complete skeleton in this way, but it actually wouldn't be 100% complete in terms of preservation. We only need one element, for instance, for each side of the skeleton. So essentially, this is using a, a data matrix, a certain, the number of characters that can be scored for all the species of that particular group, and we can then work out a completeness value for each of those species. And this has been done uh, for sauropodomorph dinosaurs, pterosaurs, a uh, bunch of um, synapsid groups, uh, and it's being done right now for a bunch of other groups, including uh, bats, and there are a few other groups that were posted uh, yesterday. So we can take this information then and work out a, a mean average completeness for all our species for any particular time interval, and look how that sort of goes through time, and then try and work out what kind of maybe impact this might have on observed diversity. So for instance, if we have um, high observed diversity and high completeness, or low completeness and low diversity, we might think that what is driving our observed patterns in numbers of species. So with that in mind, uh, we basically compiled um, a list of all uh, taxonomically diagnosable species of crocodilomorphs, uh, including uh, fossil representatives of extant species. We just looked at non-marine species, so terrestrial and freshwater, and that's primarily because we would expect a very different taphonomic filter in the marine realm. And this was all compiled initially from the paleobiology database, but then with lots of updates in the literature and trying to really refine the actual sort of ages of these specimens as well, in terms of stratigraphic ages. Uh, we also calculated body size in the form of uh, total body length for the vast majority of species in this database. So this is essentially uh, in terms of using things like skull length uh, and femoral length, and then trying to, and using various regression analyses, sorry, regression equations to try and estimate, relatively coarse estimates, the body size, but for nearly all the species in our data sets. And these were also assigned to some coarse bins of 0 to 2 meters, 2 to 4 meters, et cetera. Um, we used the largest current data matrix out there for crocodilomorphs uh, from a phylogeny from 2013, which samples widely across the tree. Uh, we also looked at this at both stage level, but also using roughly equal length time bins to try and sort of um, reduce the fact that certain time intervals are much longer than others. We looked at this on a global level, but as I mentioned, there may be problems with global analyses. So we also broke this down into paleo continent, but also in terms of paleo latitude. And we compared this with raw diversity as well. So, just to simplify, I've basically not included any error bars or standard deviation of these plots, just for simplification, not because I haven't done it yet, for certain. Um, and this is a plot, essentially, of uh, average completeness for each of our species, bin for each of our time for your species, plot against time, with uh, the modern gay going towards uh, your right. And you can see this sort of general pattern of decreasing average completeness. So actually, we're getting less complete specimens uh, on average as we're getting closer to the present. We have a big peak here in the late Triassic, this trough here is because we have actually no terrestrial record of species in the early to middle part in the early middle Jurassic. And say this general sort of decline in completeness through time, which is punctuated by the odd increase in extra trough at times. When we compare this with actual numbers of species through time, we find no significant correlation between the two. So this is suggesting that the actual completeness of the fossil specimens themselves isn't a sort of isn't a main driver of our observed numbers of species in the fossil record. But there are a number of time intervals where the two do seem to co-vary, and I'll come back to that a bit later. In terms of body size patterns, we find a statistically uh, significant, albeit weak, negative correlation between body size and completeness. So this basically means that small species tend to be more complete. Not a particularly surprising result, but it does stand up also when we look at our within our bins. So for instance, within our two to four meter bin, we do find the smaller species in that sort of bin tend to be the, uh, the most complete specimens too. So there does seem to be some aspects relating to body size in terms of your chance of being a complete specimen. In terms of taxonomic patterns, we don't find much deviation when we look at the various clades within Crocodilomorpha. So most of them sort of are roughly around the sort of 55% complete sort of level. And this suggests that given lots of these species from very different environments, so we're dealing with some species that are living in very sort of uh, terrestrial or arid environments, such as Notosuchians, and then uh, many species living in fairly semi-aquatic environments, it suggests that at least on a course level, uh, depositional environment isn't having a major effect on the completeness of these non-marine crocodilomorph fossil species. So all that's been looking at sort of global patterns. When we look at paleocontinental patterns, we can see 
really reinforcing the idea that there is really no global signal in this data. So I don't really want you to worry about actually what these sort of various ups and downs are in these plots. Essentially, these are for the six main sort of paleocontinental regions, the completeness plotted against time again. And all I really want you to take home from this is, firstly, there are no correlations between any of these areas. There are a few intervals within Europe and North America that do co-vary, but overall, we do not see sort of a common signal between these regions. So there's no actual sort of global pattern in terms of our sampling. So at any moment in time, when we're talking about the diversity of crocodile morphs, and this really is for an issue for all groups, we're not talking about diversity for the global pattern. We're always really just talking about one or maybe two different regions at any time. When we look at this latitudinally, on an initial glance, we might think that latitudinal patterns are maybe not so problematic. So this is a plot, this is, doesn't include time. This is just basically 10 degree latitudinal bins uh, with completeness here. Uh, blue is completeness and red is species. And essentially, when we're actually looking at sort of um, relatively sort of high samples, so, so ignoring this outlier here where we only have one species which happens to be 100% complete, we generally find that uh, completeness isn't much worse in the tropics than in the extra tropics overall. And this might be reassuring when we want to look at things, say, like latitudinal biodiversity gradients, if the tropical sampling isn't necessarily any worse than the temperate sampling. However, when we look at this uh, through time, so these are plots of completeness versus for, through time and uh, sort of number of species through time for 10 degree latitudinal bins just in the northern hemisphere. What you can see again is a sort of no sort of consistent patterns. So we're not seeing sort of consistent sampling or good sampling in our different regions, but also lots of times where we have either very low completeness or even complete gaps in our sampling for certain time intervals. Now at some points in time, so for instance at 50 to 60 degrees north, we might actually think that probably some of these absences are genuine absences. During slightly cooler intervals, crocodile morphs probably weren't living this high up. But for the most part, and particularly when we think about areas like 30 to 40 degrees north, these have to be sort of pure absences in our sampling, and or very low parts of sampling. So essentially, crocodile morphs are almost certainly present in this latitude throughout this time, and yet at certain time intervals, we're basically not sampling them at all. So I mentioned that we don't find that completeness is the main driver of taxonomic diversity patterns, but there are a few intervals where there does seem to be sort of clear evidence for co-variation. And so one of these is the Cretaceous Paleogene mass extinction interval. So when we look at number of species in red across the boundaries, so going from the Strictian to the Darnian, we see this big drop in diversity. So approximately more than a doubling, so halving in numbers of species. However, when we look at subsample diversity, and this is both from rarefaction and SQS, but also from phylogenetic diversity estimates, we see no evidence for a real decline across the boundary. If anything, we see even perhaps sort of a slight increase across the boundary. And this is because we have diversifications of the surviving groups. But as I said, completeness also drops precipitously across this boundary. So it's possible that the actual sort of like poor level of completeness of specimens in the early paleogene maybe is affecting our recognition of species in this time interval. And this is perhaps borne out from actual subsampling methods. So this potentially is one area where this, the actual sort of completeness of the specimens really is potentially affecting our ability to recognize species in the fossil record. So as well as maybe some of the time intervals, it does seem completeness, but also perhaps more importantly, spatial sampling does seem to be affecting our ability to recognize certain diversifications. So there's a few of these instances, and one such one is Notosuchia. So this is a primarily Gondwan and clade of animals. And until recently, there were no actual representatives of the group from pre aptian deposits, or so from earlier than about 100 million years ago. And yet, based on its sort of inferred, well, based on its sister taxon relationship with Neosuchia, which is known from the early Jurassic, we know it must have a very long ghost lineage. And so this group, primarily Gondwan, and at least when it's sampled, if it was primarily Gondwan before that as well, then probably the limited opportunity to sample crocodile morphs from southern continents prior to the Aptian might explain this ghost lineage. And this is shown here where we have very low numbers of both species and very poor completeness prior to the sort of early mid-Cretaceous. And this seems to be well supported by a recent reinterpretation of really fragmentary material from the middle Jurassic of Madagascar, which has been reinterpreted as a Notosuchian, really reducing this ghost lineage and sort of fitting this idea that basically poor sampling is obfuscating our recognition of the early diversification of this group. When we look at crocodilia, we see far fewer problems. There's actually a very good fit between estimates from molecular data uh, in terms of the origination and splits within the group and the actual fossil record. So both in the sort of the main split here between alligatoroidia, crocodiloidia, and garveoida, we see very little difference between the fossil record and molecular evidence. And we see almost a sort of like precise sort of fit with the alligator caiman split and crocodilus origination. So this might mean that we just um, this 
I think probably this means rather than necessary, we, just we sample the fossil records so much better for this group, uh, and because it's more recent, I think it's more likely we just have to be sampling in the right places in the right times at the actual moment's origination of this group. So one last thing that potentially pervades any sort of uh, understanding of diversity through time is the effect of the pull of the recent. So this was originally coined by Raup to describe the effect of um, extant taxa and range through data. So in that original meaning, it's not affecting our data. We're not using range through data to look at diversity. It's a very problematic way of looking at actual uh, reconstructing diversity in the past. But the pull of the recent has been used as a more general term to describe factors that might mean that we better sample a fossil record in younger rather than older rocks. But of the actual 24 living species of crocodilia, 15 of them have at least a putative fossil record, and actually 13 of these include quaternary deposit uh, specimens. So it suggests that at least in its original meaning, there's little effect to the pull of the recent on crocodilian diversity. But in a more general meaning, in terms of actual sort of affecting um, sort, of, uh, sort of preservation towards younger deposits, um, it does have, may potentially have some sort of effect. So of those 15 species, extant species that do have a fossil record, um, the average completeness of those 15 species is way lower than the average completeness for all crocodilian morphs or even all Cenozoic or all Neogene species. So with like slightly, half of the, slightly less than half of those have quite high completeness, but eight of these modern species are only known from skeletons that are less than 9% complete. And actually, the average is less than 4% complete. So this suggests that it's actually perhaps extremely easy to recognize extant species in the fossil record. And maybe this is also obviously because we have complete specimens of their living representatives, so it's very easy to actually recognize them in the fossil record. They're highly identifiable because we only need maybe a fragment of bone to compare it with the modern species. That's one way of thinking about it. The other way, though, potentially, though, is that some of these specimens are so fragmentary that maybe we really can't identify them down to a species level, and actually people are only really identifying it as a modern species because it's living in the same region as its extant representatives are today. So this is a bias that we still need to look into a little bit more. So in conclusion, we find overall a decrease in completeness through time. Actually, completeness is getting worse as we get closer to the presence, but it doesn't seem to be the main driver of taxonomic diversity patterns. But heterogeneity in the fossil record needs to be accounted for both on temporal levels, but also spatially. And it's a spatial aspect that's something that's really sort of starting to sort of be taken up more seriously by the vertebrate paleontology community. And in particular, this sort of aspect of sampling does seem to be affecting a recognition of early diversifications. So I focused on Notosuke before, but also we have no sampling of the early to early middle Jurassic terrestrial record of crocodilian morphs at all. It doesn't seem to have much impact on crocodilian divergences though. The KPG boundary might be affected by sampling, and maybe the completeness is affecting our ability to recognize species then, but the pull of the recent, at least in its original meaning, is not a significant problem. And with that, I'd just like to thank all those who've actually compiled crocodilian morph data uh, over the years, all those entering the paleobiology database, which remains a really vital resource if you want to look at these sort of large-scale patterns. I'd also like to thank Bob Nichols for his wonderful image on my title slide. And thanks for listening. <laughs>